It's incredible how snow transforms the environment, creating an almost otherworldly landscape, a winter wonderland. This is Arctic Sweden. Of course, you'd expect me to tell you that the temperatures here in winter can drop as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. But perhaps the more significant figure is the average winter temperature, which is minus 10. That means that just to live here, you have to have a knowledge of bushcraft. What's interesting is that here in Sweden, traditional skills of bushcraft survive alongside modern outdoor skills. And the reason for that is, of course, that they work. Of course, Sweden isn't always covered in snow. I start my journey in the late autumn before the lakes are frozen over. I've been coming here for many years. One of the things that really impresses me about Sweden is the way the local people respect the natural world. They talk about the nature, and that's something I really want to explore in this program. Sweden is a long, thin country, which at its most northern point is 240 kilometers inside the Arctic Circle. But I'm starting in the south near Karlsborg, an area that I love visiting. The landscape here is typical of Sweden, which has an abundance of natural resources. There are more than 100,000 lakes, most of which have water so clean you can drink straight from them. I'm really looking forward to spending a couple of days in this area, exploring what the forests have to offer at this time of year. And in such amazing surroundings, it hasn't been difficult to find a suitable place to set up camp. Canoeing and camping in a landscape like this is the nearest thing I know to a religious experience. It's just beautiful. But at this time of year, the days are short, so you have to be, you'd have to be very conservative about what you try to achieve. And also, with the summer visitors gone, the forest is so silent. You can hear a woodpecker tapping at wood half a mile away across the lake. It really is amazing. Even though it's quite late in the year, there are still a few wild foods to be found. This grows in Scotland as well. I'm going to take some of the leaves to show you. In English, we call that the cowberry, but uh, here in Sweden they call it lingon. These are a very important wild food here in Sweden, and they once were in other parts of Europe too. And the reason for that is that they're a natural preservative. If you put these berries in water, you can store them in that way, all through the winter. In the old days, people used to add them to other fruits. In England, we used to add them to pears, sometimes to apples as well, to help preserve those fruits before we had refrigeration. In the north, these are a very popular accompaniment made into a jelly added to wild reindeer meat. It's fantastic. It's very unusual now to see any fungi because there's been quite heavy rain and rain virtually dissolves the mushrooms. But this one here, this is a, a type of hedgehog fungus, one of the sarcodons. If I turn it over, you can see there, it almost looks like deer's hair underneath, the little spines that it has. And that's also good eating. Isn't that beautiful? It does look just like deer's fur. I'm being joined by an old friend for the evening, Lars Felt, the father of survival training in Sweden. Hey, Lars. Hi, Ray. 
How are you? Find a place. Yeah, perfect. Good. There are a few rocks here, Lars. Be careful. Okay. I've known him for more than 20 years, and we've spent many memorable trips together in the wilderness. Good to Hi, see, you. see you again. Excellent. Yeah. Would you like some coffee? Oh, please. <laughs> In Britain, in spite of the recent Right to Roam Act, there are still many places we're not allowed to go. But here in Sweden, there is an ancient right called Allemansrätten, which allows almost unlimited access. Like many Swedes, Lars spends much of his free time in the countryside, taking advantage of their relaxed laws. People here, they can stay in uh, the land and uh, they can walk through the land and they don't have permission. There are some rules in national park and things like that, but normally you can go and stay one night with your tent, even in private land. What about lighting fires? Uh, it's some regulation in, uh, in summer when it's very hot, but uh, most of the year you can make fire. There isn't a mess. People don't leave tin cans and beer cans in the fireplace. Why no. is that, do you think? I think it's an old tradition in Sweden that we, it's not only right, it's also respect. I think most of the people learn that in school. And I think also the parents have responsibility. And my responsibility now is to take care of my grandchildren. You enjoy that? Oh, yeah. And how old are your grandchildren, how old are your grandchildren now, Lars? Six and one and a half. You told me just the other day that he, the young one, he's uh, almost old enough to hold a canoe paddle. Oh, yeah. The oldest, she has a little canoe paddle, and next summer he will have one. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh, what have you got there? This is a char, the salmon fish from the lake here. It's for you if you show me the Indian way to cook it. <laughs> <laughs> that has got to be the cheekiest way <laughs> I've ever heard of getting your dinner cooked for you. All right, you're on. Thank you. Fabulous. Look at that. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that is something else, isn't it? Okay, oh, we better we better put a bit more wood on the fire, I think. Okay. The Arctic char is a type of salmon. It's highly adapted to living in freezing waters, so it can be found further north than any other freshwater fish. I've cooked it many times in many different ways, but one of my favorite ways is a method I learned from the indigenous people of Alaska. Lars is keen to see this unique way to remove all of the bones. I take my thumb and I go down to the spine, and what I want to do is I want to now ease the ribs out of the flesh with my thumb. Oh yeah. But I'm going to go all the way along the fish, like that. That's clever. So we now, now come over the other side and use the other thumb. That's why we were given thumbs, I think. Yeah. And away we go. Out come the ribs. So there are all the bones. Yeah. I always get very disappointed now when I, <laughs> when I eat this sort of fish in a restaurant and I end up having to pick bones out on the plate. It seems <laughs> very unnecessary mm. because it's so easy to fill it. It is. Oh, that's just the right length. Okay. Excellent. Good heat too. Good heat, yeah. Lovely. Okay. We'll see. It's cooking nicely. Mm. Oh. Well, here's the moment of truth. You pass me the fish? Sure. Fantastic, that looks great, doesn't it? Good colour. Really good colour. Gold. If you can pull the stick out very well. Yeah. There we go. And um, I tell you what, earlier, just before you arrived, I collected some uh, lingon berries. Yes. And I thought maybe we'd add a few lingon berries on top of there. What do you think? A little bit of That's colour. Good. Put some of those on there. 
little accompaniment to go with that. Mm. So Lars, please. Thank enjoy. you. Mm. I like the colour. Mm. Delicious. <laughs> I'm going to have a bit with some of these berries as well. <laughs> That's great. Mm. Taste of the season. Perfect. I don't know, but those berries are almost like having a glass of red wine with the fish. Fantastic. Now we only need a drum of whiskey. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I didn't bring any with me. Bad preparation, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> last days of the year are a really precious time. You know, it's five o'clock and the sun has already gone down. By the end of next month, this water will have begun to freeze over. And then the canoes have to be locked up for the winter, which is a miserable experience. Now, it's a magic time. There's a vibrant colors to be drunk in. And all of a sudden, our campfire seems to leap up and say, hey, I'm important again. It's a great time to be out especially with old friends. One of the things I really love about bushcraft is learning the different uses for trees I know in other countries. Take the humble Scots pine, for example. Back in Britain, this isn't a tree we regard with the same affection as we do the oak tree. But here in Sweden, this is one of the most common trees. And they have an incredible array of uses for this truly remarkable tree. The wood from pine is soft and durable, which means it's good for carving. I've asked Bjorn Johnson, an expert at working with pine, to make me some traditional wooden skis, which I'll need as I'll be returning to Sweden in the winter. Dead wood. A dead one? Yeah, dead, dead standing. One. Dead standing. Something like that? Something like that, yeah. Are the knots a problem? Uh, could be, but the uh, thing with this one is that it's straight. It's very straight. This tree is dead standing, which means the wood is dry, but not rotten. It's a little clearer tone. Yeah, in it. More of a ring higher up, yeah. yeah. What do you think? I think that should work quite fine. Give it a push. There she goes. Timber. Yeah. <laughs> you can see when you fell a tree, you cut in that notch to begin with, which gives the tree the ability to, to start to tilt when the time comes, and you soar in above the apex of the V. The reason for this is as, as the tree tilts, it pushes against there, stops it jumping up backwards, and it falls in the right direction. Effectively, this becomes a hinge and it falls 90 degrees to that, straight as it has. The next job is to split the trunk. The tree has grown differently on each side, depending on its direction towards the sun and the prevailing winds. So the only way to get a balanced pair of skis is to use two lengths of wood from the same side of the tree. There we are. Yeah, 
told it would work. <laughs> Tell you what, Bjorn, I'm really surprised at the weight of this piece of wood. Oh, so am I. It's heavy, isn't it? It is. For it's a piece of pine. It's a lot of tar in it, so that's why it's still heavy. Once the wood is suitably dry and has been sawn into planks, Bjorn can start work on the skis. He is using a traditional axe to hew the shape out, which takes great skill. looking nice, isn't it? It's getting better. Which yeah. is going to be the running surface of this? Of this the will be the running surface. Yeah. And, and why is that? Why is that? Um, you get the, the fibres running straight across, straight through the ski, yeah. like this, and it makes it stronger. So you choose the side where these are, st are most um, perpendicular to the, yeah. to the surface? exactly. Right, OK. When you run on these skis later on, um, all the soft wood in between, the white wood in between here is going to wear out wear a little out. bit. Yeah. And they're going to make a so the ski becomes like the, the 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 rings become like lots of little skates. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Having learned to make skis out of wood, Bjorn now teaches the method to others. It really impresses me how traditional skills like this are kept alive in Sweden. In today's age, when we have all the modern materials to make skis, why make them of wood? That's a good question, really. But getting to know how to do it was for me a big, uh, big challenge, really. But then doing my own skis and, and then go out and run on them in the deep snow, is like, that was absolutely great. Really satisfying. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of going and buy something, you know, you don't know how it's been manufactured or what kind of waste it, there is from the things they used to make in the ski in the plastic or, you know, toxic waste or whatever. Yeah. The skis are born of nature and that we're using a living tree, as it were. And when you're finished with them, they return to it. Exactly. After hours spent carving the skis, they're ready to be bent into shape. Steam is used to soften the wood and make it pliable. Yeah, we could try that. These cross-country skis are traditional in this part of the world. They have a large curve at the front, making it easier to travel through deep snow. They'll be left in the rack overnight so that they can set into the characteristic shape. Meanwhile, I'm going to find another substance from the pine tree which we'll need in the process of making skis, pine tar. In this area, Pine tar has been an important commodity for centuries. As a preservation for wood, it has been used extensively in building, particularly within the shipping industry. Oka Carlson is an expert when it comes to the pine, and he knows these forests intimately. Tar and turpentine are what keeps a growing tree from rotting alive. It's natural preservatives. They're found in abundance in the roots of the tree, Dinging up ancient dead roots and stumps also means the living trees aren't damaged. This is the pine that Ocker dug up from the, the bog. It's absolutely suffused with turpentine. You can really smell it. It's much stronger than ordinary wood from, from the forest here. Fantastic smell. Here we go, okay. So put it in here. Yeah, it's a long time there, so it's a little a bit. It's going to be good, so. what's going to happen is when we've got this full of the wood, we're going to put a lid on, on top, and seal it around the edge so that it's airtight on top here. Then we light a fire around it. When the wood inside gets to 430 degrees Celsius, it starts to produce tar. That drops under the action of gravity and will drop out of the bottom. In the old days, they'd dig a hole in the ground and put another container underneath it. 
but today, so that people can see what happens, there's a tube running out the bottom, and that's where the tar's going to come out. OK, how long have you been doing this? Yeah, I have been doing this in 10, 15, or 15 years. I've been making tar in this way for about 15 years, but when I was younger, I used to help make it commercially in the forest. We dig 50 meter long trenches and produce around 5,000 liters of tar at a time. These days, I travel around demonstrating this traditional skill to the public and in schools. There's so much tar in this wood, especially the roots, that you can light it first time. It'll only take around an hour for the wood packed inside to produce the tar. While we're brewing up the tar over there, I thought I'd show you another use of the pine tree. And this comes from Finland. It's something that was done during the Second World War using dry seasoned pine logs like this to make a cooking stove that can be put inside a tent or used just out in the forest to cook on top of. It gives great warmth and it's very controllable. And all that I've done is I've cut a cross into the log using a chainsaw here. It can be done with a handsaw. And if you haven't got a handsaw, you can actually just split a log into four and stick the ends into the ground close together like this. That would also work. What I'm going to do now is take some bark and pop that down into these slots, which are light, so that I can ignite this log. Also put a few small twigs in, dry twigs, to help make the thing catch fire. Well, that's the stove going. You can see now it's burning all of its own. It doesn't need any tending. It just, it just goes, on, goes on and on and on. Fantastic fire. And the great thing is we can put our kettle on top to brew up some tea. One of the other advantages of this is that if you put it on snow, because the base isn't hot, it doesn't sink into the snow, which is absolutely ideal here in winter. All I need now are a few fresh pine needles for one of my favorite brews, pine needle tea. How have we done then, Orca? Now how many it circa five liters? Four or five liters. Five liters. Five liters. Yeah. That's fantastic. Look at that. That's amazing. This is often called Sweden's black gold. There was a time when the Royal Navy floated because of this material, and its ropes and its rigging didn't rot because they were treated with this sort of tar. This was a very important commercial product. It's too hot at the moment to open up this casing, but if we did, what we'd find inside there is this, charcoal. That's all that would be left of the wood that we put in earlier today. But even that doesn't go to waste. Bjorn, the tar. Oh, This right. is the tar we made from the, uh, from the pine. I think that's really first class thick yeah, stuff. Yeah, this is really thick. Yeah, well, you said you wanted tar. We will supply you with nothing but the best. <laughs> Bjorn is heating the wood first so that the tar soaks in well. 
A good coat on these skis means no water will be able to get into the pine and the wood will be preserved. Well, Bjorn, that's fantastic. Yeah, amazing. They look great. It's, it's quite something, isn't it, I think? Just a piece of pine, like the old tree here, and the tar from the tree itself yeah. provide everything that we need. So a really useful tree. It is really useful. Thank <laughs> you. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank it's you. Great Luke. watching your work. It's fantastic. Okay. Enjoy and have a good run with them. I hope we do. Yeah. <laughs> the skis will be vital in the north when I return in the winter. But before I leave the south, I want to see how the most important tool in bushcraft is made, in the traditional way. Hey, Julius. Hey. Nice to meet you. I brought you some charcoal from the forest. Is that going to be some use to you, do you think? Yeah, I think it will do the trick. Excellent. Yeah. Right then. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. So you want me to do a knife? A knife? Yeah. We'll fix that. We'll take the charcoal. OK. Julius Pettersson is part of a long tradition of blacksmithing, yet another skill which still thrives here. Some of the best knives in the world are made in Sweden. I have asked Julius to make me a general purpose knife blade, suitable for using in the bush. He's wrapping a piece of hard carbon steel within a softer metal to give the blade both strength and flexibility. Julius makes it look easy, but the knowledge and experience which is needed to do this takes many years to learn. Julius, how did you become interested in making knives and, and, and the blacksmithing tradition here? Yeah, it started when I was about six. I was um, visiting my grandfather, and he's a blacksmith. And when I was six years old, he made me a knife. And you know, a little boy with a knife, he was my hero. Oh, Always, yeah. The edge of the knife is ground to the correct shape. And after various stages of reheating, the knife is hard enough for a final polish. All my blade needs now is the handle, which I plan to make when I'm in the north. So, here's the knife. Well, Julius, that's fantastic. That's, I'm really impressed. Beautiful. That's how the most important tool in bushcraft is manufactured. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's a tradition which we both share, both yeah. in England and in Sweden, and that is uh, if someone gives you a knife, you must give them a silver coin, lest the blade cut a friendship. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Tack you. My journey takes me 1,100 kilometers north to Swedish Lapland. When autumn turns to winter, temperatures here can drop as low as minus 50. And it seems a completely different country. Most of the bird species escape to warmer climes, and to live here, you really have to be hardy. All the lakes and most of the rivers are frozen solid, with the ice in some places a metre deep. What this does mean is that the wilderness becomes more easily accessible. You can travel great distances across the frozen water, either by snowmobile or by dog sled, which is something I've always wanted to try. Stefan Ha owns 60 huskies, which he has trained to pull sleds. It's a traditional means of transport, which has been used across the north for centuries. Throughout the winter, the dogs clock up an impressive mileage. We estimate every dog runs somewhere between six and six and a half thousand kilometers in the winter. That's incredible. 
Now these dogs have a hard life, don't they? I mean, a hard life, but a very happy life. Yeah. This is what they're meant to be doing. Um, it would be even harder on the dogs not taking them out running as we do. These dogs aren't like normal domestic dogs in Britain. They thrive in extreme temperatures. When they're out working, they need minus 20 degrees Celsius or colder to be able to give it all without running hot. So today, when it's minus 10, it's quite warm for them, actually. Mind you, though, they don't lose body heat from lying still in the snow unless it's below 50. Then they have to you know, move around a little bit to maintain body heat. So this is no problem at all. The dogs know to follow trails already made by snowmobiles. As the harder the snow has been compacted, the faster they can run. For each sled, there is one dog which takes control of the rest of the pack and is known as the lead dog. Staffan doesn't use reins to steer the pack, but relies on his lead dog, the white one here on the right, to follow his commands. Hergen, 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 Hergen. Well, that was fantastic. We've come a long way today. It's over 50 kilometers and the dogs are tired now. You can see that they start to slow down on the hills and you have to help them a lot more, but that's all part of it. But it's great. There was a tricky moment coming through the woods when uh, the sledge it turned suddenly and the sledge went the wrong way of the wrong, wrong side of a tree and I just added, whoa, hang on. And although the dogs don't understand any English, they knew what to do and they just stopped and waited, sorted it, I said, okay, and away we went. It's fantastic. It's brilliant. A snowmobile can't do that. It can't think for you. It's a marvellous way to travel. What a great way to start my time up here in the north. For the next few days, I'll be staying in traditional log cabins like this and exploring the bushcraft of Swedish Lapland. The Arctic can be a tough place to survive in winter. Temperatures can drop by 30 degrees within hours. Traveling here, you are often miles from help, which means at any time, you may have to rely upon your skills. But with a little knowledge and the right equipment, there is food to be found. Under my feet is a fast flowing river full of fish. After digging through the snow, I drill a hole through the ice, which is about a meter thick, into which I'll set my line. In all, I'm going to drill five holes to give me the best chance of catching something. One of the joys of this environment is that this water is clean enough. You can drink it straight from the rivers like that. Fantastic. That is beautifully fresh water. And you get very thirsty here because the air is so dry at these temperatures that every breath you take, your body has to humidify it. So you lose a lot of water just breathing here. These are the hooks, I've got them here ready to go. Very simple knot. Doesn't need to be anything elaborate. Now, the fish I'm trying to catch is called a burbot. The way I'm going to catch it is 
is by using a bait fish like this. Now I've got to squeeze it and make sure that the swim bladder, which is like a little, little chamber of air inside him, is burst so that he doesn't keep floating up underneath the ice. I flush the hole with the auger so that the bait is sucked down into the river. This river is quite fast flowing and underneath the ice here there are little sandbars which move so you never know quite what the depth is going to be when you put the line down. What I want is that I've got to have this line just off the bottom. I, I can feel there when the line stops going down like that, that's that's the bottom there, just there. Tying the line to the stick means I can hang it in the center of the hole where it is less likely to freeze. Stuffing some spruce boughs down the hole also helps to prevent it freezing over. But the most important thing is to cover it with a thick layer of insulating snow. So I can find it again. I mark it with these sticks. And there are just four more to do. If I'm lucky, I might get them done before nightfall. It's best to leave the lines for at least one night. They say around here that a full moon helps to get the fish biting. I've learned to trust this sort of advice. I'll find out when I go back and check them sometime tomorrow. In the winter, the forest is blanketed with snow and looks and sounds completely different. It's impossible to get around without skis. The skis that Bjorn made are working perfectly. Of course, skis like this are not designed for downhill peace skiing. They're designed to access the deep snow in the forest. And for that, they excel. One of the things I really love to do is to get out into the forest, particularly on a day like this, and just have a look around, see what's moving, read the newspaper of the woods, the tracks written on the ground. It's magical. Despite it being winter, there are still many animals around, though some are easier to spot than others. With the crew in tow, I'm not likely to see much today. But what I am interested in is the stories their tracks can tell. All through the forest here are these trails and they look quite large but actually they're left by a very small creature. These are left by the ptarmigan. The ptarmigan is one of the birds that does stay here throughout the winter. They're very well adapted to living in the snow, even having feathers between their claws to act like snowshoes. What they're looking for, in fact, you can, I can see very clearly that they've already eaten them, are the buds that occur on the birch here. These little marks here are made by the wingtips as it's landed, you can see here where his feet have come in hard, and there's the impression of the bird's body. That's the actual landing site. And then that bird's walked along here, <laughs> come up here, gone to the toilet, and then turned and taken off. This is the trail of a fox. From the crispness of the tracks that have been left here, I can see that it was last night probably wasn't any sooner than, more recent than that, but to test that, like if I push the base of the track, I can feel that the ground has frozen. And that means that the trail is old enough for the ground to have frozen after the fox passed. If it was fresh, it would still be soft. 
This is the uh, tracks of reindeer. You can see here where they've come through. And this hollow that I'm standing in is where they've been digging down through the deep snow to try and get at the lichen that they eat for food. And this year they're having a bit of a problem because it's been quite a warm winter and there have been thaws that have frozen. So you've got ice underneath the snow on the moss itself. When they can't get at the lichen on the ground, they look for lichen on the trees. And you can see some of that just here. This is called Old Man's Beard here, or it's an Alectoria lichen, and they'll eat that. And further up there, I can see where the reindeer's gone, and there's lots of uh, little pine needles brought down where they've been eating this off of the trees. Now time to check the five fishing lines and see whether or not I've been lucky. Nothing on that one. Oh, yes we have. There we go. That's, that's a fish called a burbot. And uh, very ugly looking fish, but fantastic eating. There we go. One down, four to go. So far, so good. Three. Oh, good one. I can't believe it. <laughs> Hole number four, four fish. My best day fishing ever. I can't believe it, but it doesn't normally happen like that, I have to tell you. Five holes, five fish, someone's smiling on me today. I'd have been happy with one, but that's a real result. <laughs> That'll keep the crew happy for a couple of days. I've learned skills like this from the people who have the deepest knowledge of this environment, the local inhabitants, the Sami. Per Nils Laba comes from a long line of Sami who have made their living from the reindeer. They say this is the toughest job in Sweden and it's not hard to see why. Per Nils spends much of the year working alone as he follows his huge herd of reindeer in their search for food across the frozen wilderness of the north. It's my life, the reindeer. Uh, it's give me food and it's give me money, everything. Do you enjoy your life? Uh, yes, it's a hard life, but it's a... Uh, very nice life. It's a, you, are, you are free and you can do what you want to do. Of course, the one question I mustn't ask you is how many reindeer you have. Uh, then I must ask you how much money you have in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> the Sami are the oldest inhabitants of the Arctic. For thousands of years, they led a nomadic life with the whole family working together to look after their herd. Their home was a portable tent called the Lavu, and they developed a rich and distinctive culture. By necessity, they developed a deep knowledge of bushcraft, such as using dry sedge instead of socks, which is warmer and easier to dry. Even today, Per Nils relies heavily on his bushcraft heritage. Reindeer boots are still warmer and more flexible than modern boots. To repair things, he carries with him a traditional sewing kit. And you'll never see him without his lasso, which he uses to catch reindeer 
and which he can also use to haul himself out of water should he fall through the ice. And of course, that most important tool, a knife. Traditionally, the Sami would make use of every part of the reindeer. The sinews were used as a strong thread. The skins were used to make clothing and traditional handicrafts, which they would trade and are still an important means of income. Per Nil's wife, Britt Marie, is an expert in skin tanning and still uses the traditional methods. After removing the fur, she uses a birch bark solution to clean the skin. She then begins a long process of scraping it to remove the loose flesh and create a smooth surface. After further soaking, the skin is then left out to dry. So you've, you've taken the skins, you've taken the hair off of them, and you've treated them with a bark solution yes. and dried them. What happens next? Then I take it inside and begin to work with this. So then when we have taken the skin, then it's hard. Yes. That's beautiful colour. I mean, that's beautiful, yes. but it's still very stiff. You wouldn't want to wear that. No. Then we must begin to work with this. And this is all the young girls' first work is to learn to to make it soft. Soft, soft and supple. Yeah. Uh, you wet it. Yeah. With the with the coffee or with the bark. Yeah. So we've got we've got some of the yeah we have some of the bark solution yeah. there. Yes. So then I only take. That's cool. That's cold. Yeah. That's cold. Yeah. So I put the hand in yeah. the bark water, yeah. and then I only wet it yeah. like this. And then the big, you begin to work with this. Just like that. Like this. And it takes a whole day. Today, the Sami people still make leather like this. Yes. From the legs, we make the trouser, the winter clothes. From this sort of skin, we can make summer clothes. And that's because you prefer these materials to the modern ones. They work better. Yes, we don't buy the, that because we, we think they have uh, burned it too much with the chemical. Chemicals, they put too yeah. many chemicals in the leather. Yeah, in the skin. And then it's be too soft and then it's, yeah, this is the best. I understand that. This is the knife blade that Julius made down in Carlsborg. And I brought this north because there's a real tradition up here in Lapland of making beautiful knives. And uh, the handles are made very often from a composition of leather, bark, antler, and wood. And the, the antler they use is reindeer antler. This is the antler from a reindeer that's a male reindeer that's six or seven years old. And one of the things about this material is its solidness. The marrow in here is very fine, making this antler much stronger, say, than uh, a red deer antler. Small discs are cut from the antler, and these, along with leather and wood, in this case a beautiful piece of patterned birch, will make up the handle. The pieces are slid onto the tang of the knife and glued into place. The final piece of antler is secured by riveting over the end of the tang. This holds all the discs in place and gives the handle its strength. Once the glue is dry, there is the laborious process of filing and sanding the handle into shape. This is our long job. Finally, a drop of linseed oil is rubbed onto the handle to seal it.
that's how the handle is finished. The, um, one of the traditions up here, though, is also to engrave beautiful patterns into the antler work. And uh, the intricacy with which those patterns are carved is sometimes quite astonishing. It's a, real, it's a really specialised Sami craft. I can show you how it's done. If I use this piece of, this piece of antler here, Rather than just scratching the surface, the design is actually carved out of the antler. Powder made from the inner bark of a silver birch is then rubbed into the grooves. It's great fun to do, but my little efforts are crude in comparison to Sami craftsmanship. Let me show you this. This is a knife made by Brick Marie. And you can see the intricacy of her scrimshaw work is just exquisite. Beautiful work. And the sheath for this knife is itself made from antler. The Sami culture has evolved in concert with their extraordinary environment. Here in the Arctic Circle in the middle of summer, the sun never sets, and in the deep winter, it never rises. It's a uniquely beautiful place, but at the same time, uncompromising and harsh. To survive here, you have to be hardy. That's one of the things I really admire about the Sami, is that not only do they see beyond the hardships of the darkness in the darkest part of winter and the extreme cold, but they actually start to love this environment and celebrate its spiritual benefits. Their ancient religion included the belief that all living things had a soul and should therefore be treated with great reverence. Everybody was expected to move quietly in the wilderness, showing respect for all living things. One way the Sami would express their respect and reverence for nature was in the yoik, the name given to a unique way of singing. Like many Sami, Yana Mungi grew up hearing the yoik. She now works as a professional singer and is keen to continue the tradition. So what does the word yoik actually mean? It's, oh, it's very difficult, but it's, it's so easy and still it's difficult because if you do like the wind yoik, I a little bit turn myself into the wind. And it, I mean like this. That is a small wind and it comes along and then you you are the wind when you do the wind yoik. And some of the yoiks have words but, but some don't have words, is that right? Yes. It's just an expression of a feeling. Uh, yes, it's a I I could often say like this, it's a, some kind of the Sami blues. And I think that's a, everybody can relate. You just put in some words if you want to put in it, just to express it a little bit more. Like the sun is shining, oh, la, 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 la. the sun is so gorgeous, oh, la, 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 la. and it's it can be just like that. 
the nature, the forest, the mountains. For us, it's uh, not something that you you long for or attach to. You, you're addicted to it. You you need it in your life, and it's uh, a part of our life. So it's uh, it's very natural. You you cannot think of a life without it. And you used to have a, a religion that, would, that that reflected that, didn't you? Yes. On this drum, you can see the winter man, the sun, the the forest god and uh, the tree goddesses that are so important. When I first started to hear about the spirits of the forest, the, the, the one that really appealed to me was the wind god. Yeah. As this being that's supposed to stand with great paddles and, and swing around. And, you know, when you're out in the forest and you feel that wind cutting towards you, you can really feel that yes. there is a god out there spinning around with these paddles. It's one of my favorite goddesses. It's the wind man. It's the wind god. His name is Diegolmai. Does the drum have any magic properties? The magical, yes, that's it. It's uh, with this drum before in the old religion, you used it to talk with the gods. And you put the pointer on the drum and with a hammer, you used to hammer to have the pointer to jump around. And where the pointer stops, you can breathe out from that a little bit what's going to happen. So maybe it was on uh, Begel Mai, it's going to be windy, or the sun man, or oh, look there, BBC is coming. No. <laughs> <laughs> As well as singing in a traditional way, Jana incorporates the yoik into more popular music. This is her way of keeping the Sami spirit alive and taking it into the future. This is the music, I pick it from the forest. I just go out there and sit and have my yoik and put it to my musicians and they help me to put on music that feels good. And often it comes in a modern way because I live in a, I live in a modern world. I live in a modern house and with Everything is modern, except when I go out to my relatives, I see them, I, I'm, I'm a part of nature. I am nature. I like that idea that you come out into the forest and find your songs in the same way I find fungi to eat, or yeah. berries. Yeah, it I think that's, that's very special. This has been a wonderful trip. The Sami and the Swedish nation as a whole have made a huge impression on me. I've met many wonderful people, and it's fantastic to see the traditional skills of bushcraft thriving in a modern world, not as living history, but because they still work. But it's the understanding, respect, and connection to the nature which makes Sweden such a special place. It's not leaves on the line or the wrong kind of snow. Indian train companies have to deal with annual torrential rains. And there's a huge eccentric workforce who do it. BBC Four follows their lives with Monsoon Railway, starting in a moment. <laughs> <laughs>